All right, Acts 20, watch this, Acts 27. The Apostle Paul is has got a problem. Here, and, here, and here's the problem. Watch what, the, watch what this means. Suppose this picture here is exactly what I'm saying. Suppose that we're, we're on board cities and nations. The church is over here, has the solution, but they're not mobilized to leverage their influence in high places. They're not showing up where the gates of hell are, and they're not governing. They're at a distance, praying about and talking about. If what I'm saying is true, then it would look like this. It's almost like, take those same mountains. What we got is like, remember the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is stuck on a ship. And that ship is going off. It's got it's a big ship. It's got 270 souls on it, 230 souls on it. And this ship is taken off. And here's where Paul's dilemma is. He knows what the country ought to do, but nobody's listening to him. And he's watching them go down the road of making some disastrous decisions. So here we have Paul is on board a ship in chapter 27. And he says, verse 10, Sirs, I perceive this voyage is going to be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. In other words, I have a perception of the future, and I'm concerned. Nevertheless, the centurion believes the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. What do you got here? You got these different compartments. Right here, you got three. You got over here, you got the religion compartment where Paul is a prisoner on board this ship. Over here, you've got the um, captain of the ship and the owner of the ship. You got the guy that's in charge of the service industry and you got the guy that's in charge of the money. And they're meeting with the government, who's a centurion. Those are the three players on board the ship, religion, government, and business. While you have arts and media and family and those things are there, you want to know where the primary, primary conflict is? It's over the conscience of the culture, which is supposed to be in the hands of the people of faith. We're supposed to guard the culture's conscience, help to continue to keep it walking in the fear of God, influencing culture. But then the government is going to make some choices, and business is going to dialogue with government about what's in the best interest of the practical aspect of running a ship. And depending on their level of faith or your level of credibility, they may not be listening to you. Paul was overruled. What do you do when you're a remnant, but you don't have as much influence as you need during a time of crises? Good question. Certainly good in my country. I think you guys are better off than the United States right now in this sense. So what, Paul, what happens is the centurion believed the master, verse 11, and owner of the ship more than Paul. They believed the prognosticators and the wisdom of their council chambers more than the man of God with the word. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, it wasn't convenient, the more part advised, which means they had like a little vote and the majority said, eh, forget what Paul says, let's get out of here. So they take off. The south wind blows softly. The devil always gives you a soft wind in the wrong direction to start. But not long after, verse 14, there arose against it a tempest wind called the Eurocon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up, and the wind we let her drive. Now you're in a crisis you can't get out of. With me on this? Running under the sea. So what happens is now they're trying to undergird the ship. You know what you got here is, you got in my country, what you have is you have a gash put in the front of the ship by Wall Street, and then you have the government over here trying to do a bailout. It's quite realistic to me. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, the no small tempest, in other words, it's getting worse out there, people. After long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. What's Paul doing? Paul isn't saying, well, the Lord said I'm going to Rome, so I'm just going to go relax and go to sleep because Jesus is going to get me there. He's actually warring for the fulfillment of his destiny. You know why? Because his destiny is being affected by other people's choices. This is a very important little piece of chapter here. So he's fasting and praying so that this destiny doesn't get interrupted. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, you should have listened to me. Nothing like an annoying Jew at this moment right here. Uh-huh, you see, you should have listened to me. He's got to remind them. And you should have left loose from Crete and gained all his loss and harm. Look how the mess you got into because you didn't listen to me. But he doesn't just wag his finger at the problem and say, uh-huh, 
This is what happens when you're an ungodly nation. He doesn't say that, because I would want that guy back in the basement. Here's what he says. Be of good cheer. I love this, because Paul now becomes the solution to the problem nobody else can solve. Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. What are we talking about? His prophetic face in the future is the reason why he's going to get rescued. What's happening here is Jesus told him, you're going to have to appear before Caesar two chapters earlier in a prayer closet. When Paul gets stuck on board the ship, he says, I wouldn't leave right now if I was you. They overrule him, get themselves into a situation where they're going to drown him. He fasts and prays. He makes his unfinished assignment, his argument with deliverance. And an angel of God breaks through the chaos, shows up in his cabin. And I love this line. Watch this line. This is amazing. Saying, fear not, Paul. You must be brought before. In other words, your unfinished assignment is about to deliver you from death. But more than that, God's given you all them that sail with you. See, he was with them up until the tipping point. Now, they are with him that the situation changed. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. We just are going to have to cast upon a certain island. I'm not quite sure the details, but this ship's getting broken up, and there's an island somewhere we're going to bump into. That much the Lord showed me. So basically now they all look at each other and go, wow, that's good news. Now they're believing the report of the man of God. But you notice what happened? Who is now running the ship? Paul's running the ship. Because the moment that tipping point came, he was no longer traveling with them hostage. They were traveling as a prisoner on board his destiny. 270 souls are going to get saved, and they're all going to travel now with Paul. In other words, like the angel says, I've got to deliver the FedEx package. You're it, and God's given you all those other packages that are traveling on this ship. They hit an island. When they hit the island, it's cold and it's rainy. It's not the best of timing, but they make it. They swim to shore. When they get there, they're cold. Paul is picking up sticks. What does he do? He throws a stick on the fire. Do you know what happens next? A serpent comes out from the flames because of the heat. Fastens on his hand. Paul is singled out at that moment on that island according to the people that are on that island, as the single most unlucky guy they've ever seen. And it even says in the book of Acts, and they're watching him and saying, no doubt this man is cursed because he just barely survives the plane crash and got run over by the ambulance. He makes it all the way to here, and then he's, this serpent, this particular viper, bad. He's going to swell up within three minutes, stick out his mouth, dead. But here's the deal. Paul shakes off the viper into the fire. Now what he's got is free advertising. Everybody's watching him. And what you've got to know is, when you're on board someone else's ship, but you have an assignment to complete, your assignment is to prevail in prayer if you can't prevail in persuasion, because God will overrule what other people do so you can finish your prophetic purpose. Got that? Secondly, the territory that comes to you as a result of what the enemy tried to take from you becomes an enlargement of your inheritance, which means after you survive the attack, God gives you more territory than you originally had had you not been attacked in the first place. So God says to the devil, all right, you're going to try to interrupt the thing and kill him? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to add more territory to him because you tried to do that. So God now gives Malta. Malta wasn't in the original plan. God added it. So now Paul lands on an island. 
but the territory knows who he is, even though nobody else does. This is part of the conundrum for a believer. You're carrying something the devil knows you got, but the world doesn't recognize who you are. But in that territory, something came out and fastened on his hand. You know what the point is? You're carrying something that will drive the hidden works of darkness to the surface because of the heat you bring into the territory. So that's why, like, you know, we don't have time to talk about this, but this is the person, this is the weird stuff you go through. This is like, why is this group after you? Why are these, but because they're the vipers being driven to attack you because of the heat. Here's the good news. You shake it off, you won't suffer harm. God's now going to add territory to you. So right at this point, these guys are saying, he's not dying. He ain't human. Ain't nobody can survive that and, and live. He must be Superman. So now they're following him around thinking he's like Superman. The governor on the ship, back to government, has a father who's sick, dying with a bloody flux, tuberculosis. He's coughing up blood and foam. Paul goes into the hut. Now it's time. This is the first miracle of healing. Notice this is the first time we're going into the signs and wonders revival. And that's what I want to suggest to you. You don't always have to lead with the prayer for the sick. You might be leading by taking over the ship. So now he prays. God delivers this man. They line up. Healing revival takes over. What do you think happens when it's time for them to return back to Rome? I'll tell you what happens. Paul is the most influential guy on the island and on board the ship. And you better believe all those sailors who just watched what happened, their survival, they're all saying to Paul on the way back, so how do you feel, buddy? You feel like this is uh, time to go? You got a good feeling on this one? I mean, you know. And so Paul, yo, this is it. We're going to go. It's like... We're going, everybody. Okay, we're going. You know, everybody's comfortable now because the rabbi's happy. And so for the next three months, they got Rabbi Saul, who delivered them from death and who just took an island and is being laid with all these honors as he's getting on board that ship. And the crew's watching it. Jesus said, if any man serves me, him will my father honor. Every piece that you need to make it through circumstances in the next hour are all within that illustration. And that nice thing is, that's not just a story, that's history. Michael Crott's history, four times elected a state senator in his state. He saw heaven. He talked to Jesus. He came back into his body because of his unfinished assignment. The Apostle Paul's face was in the future. I want to pray for you right now that you will see more clearly than ever that we're, as a church, God is opening up territorial influence with government and business so that you can start to become the person who takes Malta in your own community, in your own life. God wants to enlarge your territory. Father, I thank you. Just put your hands out like this. We're going to pray for an acceleration. Father, I thank you for the acceleration.